So welcome to the discussion panel, uh, climate crisis, uh, science, ethnic, communication and politics uh, promoted by the Union for the Mediterranean and uh, by the Italian Public Broadcasting Service. Gramenos Mastroieni, diplomat, professor, writer, you are the director of the Union. What science uh, have what science uh, uh, science can play a role in politics? Well, first of all, thank you very much uh, and welcome to the Mediterranean House at COP28. This is a pavilion, uh, a virtual pavilion that hosts a coalition of 10 partners, all engaged in uh, finding a good future for our Mediterranean region. Uh, science in the case of the Mediterranean has been uh, totally crucial. The Mediterranean is in a strange situation because it is indeed a, a climate hotspot. The second fastest warming region in the world, the, the waters of the Mediterranean are the fastest warming and connected with this predict with these measurements, there are some predicted impacts which are sincerely scary, but this is not uh, the point. The fact is that at the same time, the Mediterranean has always been a sea of conflicts where the different states didn't really recognize each other. And on top of that, all the climate issues are uh, considered politically within the COP. In the COP, the Mediterranean does not exist. The Mediterranean region is actually divided in three negotiation groups that are generally opposing on the main issues. So we could not exist until science improved. At a certain point, also due to our backing, a voluntary group of scientists released a report, 2019, called the Marwan Report. This group of scientists is called the MEDEC, that showed precisely how we all share the same destiny around this scheme. This information, precise, proven, kick-started a series of political processes which are absolutely extraordinary. First, it gave a legitimation for the Mediterranean to be present at the COP. We are not negotiators of such, but we are one of the strongest uh, observers and advocacy leaders in the COP, and we can bring a message. We are the Mediterranean. It's similar to what the islands did. The islands are like us. They're very desperate, they're in different oceans, they belong to different negotiation groups, CARICOM rather than G77, whatever you want, but they recognize that they had a common interest, that they had the same problems, and so they exerted a very effective pressure in the COP. One that changed the course of, uh, of the negotiation. Now, due to science, making it clear that we have a Mediterranean community around the challenge of climate, not only we have a reason to be united at the COP, but something magical, really magical started. States which were in principle opposing started to recognize that they had a common interest. And this in turn opened the way to a series of negotiations, practical solutions, cooperation networks that places the Mediterranean way beyond the point at which negotiations in the COP are. We arrived to a conclusion, and this is our approach, that would have not been possible without science showing us that we all share the same problem. And uh, the methodology, the conclusion based on science that we adopted and is working very well is the following. Around the Mediterranean, there are strong and weak groups richer and poorer states, but nobody, not even the richest, had enough means to face a crisis of this magnitude and pace. But if we take those differences that in the past made us have tensions and disputes, you realize that we have a larger basket of solutions. We just have to put them together and we have a much higher resilience and resistance and change power. Two very easy examples. Energy. The European Union wants to decarbonize by 2050, but it is quantitatively impossible without relying on the solar power or the solar potential 
on the South Shore and on the real potential of the Balkans. In turn, those sectors cannot really develop if they only rely on internal markets. They would not have enough finance. We join the dots. We have a plan which is flying, which is together we can. Same thing is happening in agriculture, more silently. You know, in um, roughly 10, 15 years time, Southern Europe will have a climate that we don't know, but it's a climate that has been known and managed by South Shore Mediterranean during five, 6,000 years. We need the know-how. We also need the phytogenetic heritage of the South. In practice, those plants, both in forestry and agriculture that are viable and productive now on the South Shore, could be the plants, the heritage that can save our agricultures and economies in a very near future. It might sound a little bit abstract, but let me give you just an example. If you're familiar with the wine and vine sector, there is a very rapid migration to the north of the, of the different uh, uh, kinds of grapes. We're already talking about producing, I don't know, champagne in Sweden. This might be happening, but the know-how if you want to produce champagne, it's still in France. And if you want to produce cava, it's still in Spain or Prosecco, it's still in Italy. All this cross-contaminates and makes us uh, see and actually already uh, run quite quickly, quicker than the pace of negotiation of the plan that says, together we can. All we need to do is recognize that differences are not a reason to be opposed one to the other, but to be stronger all together. All this, which is the mark of the Mediterranean, it's a message that we're bringing to the top, would have not been possible without the scientists voluntarily gathering together. We were not paid to draft a report that says, guys around the world, the Mediterranean is a climate hotspot and we have to face it all together. Thank you. Thank you, Gramenos, Mastroianni, one of the director of the unions of Mediterranean. And uh, say, let's go to introduce Andrea Ghianda, head of communication of ECCO, the Italian climate think tank. So climate change denial was good information and communication. This is really a big issue. Uh, what's the, the best way to communicate effectively the climate change issues now? Thank you, thank you, Claudia, and thank you to, 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 for the invitation to this uh, interesting conversation on, on, on communication. As a communication expert, I would like to focus on, on the narrative that we see around uh, climate change, mostly in the media. And, and, and apologies if I keep my, my phone on, but I have a few notes, uh, so uh, I'm not checking the notes. <laughs> I'm actually just following the so, notes. <clears throat> uh, the question here is, I think, when does the media talk about uh, climate change and how they do it? Uh, most of the time we see that the media discuss climate change when there is uh, a natural disaster, uh, a flood, uh, a drought, uh, something that uh, raised the, uh, the interest of the public because the public is looking for answers on that. Um, and normally what happens is that the the public is looking for someone to blame. And normally the blame goes to the local administrator, to the government, because they did not enough to prevent something that could have been prevented. And, um, and so I think it's difficult to link uh, the narrative to the real causes of climate change, because you just focus on the immediate need. And the immediate need in top is called adaptation. So what can you do to prepare a territory, a region to adapt to you know the change that is brought by the raising temperature, and uh, and the narrative obviously goes in that direction, and uh, and, and that's why you see that kind of of of, uh, of, con of conversation. But if the climate change narrative would be a novel of an Agatha Christie novel, I mean the smoking gun, it is pretty obvious to see. I mean. Uh, and it's uh, the board burning of oil, gas, and coal. This is the real cause of raising the temperature and climate change. And it's not echo, it's not myself saying that, it's the entire 
uh, community of scientists on climate change that is uh, telling us with an urgent need that this is the real cause and we need to do something about that. But it's also true that when you have the water at your knees, when your uh, house is, 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 is holding down, you don't think about that. You don't want to be told that you need to change your car. You need to change your habits. You need to change the way you cook your meal, the way you keep your your, your uh, you make your home uh, warm. Uh, it's very difficult for you to make that connection. You just want to say why that river wasn't uh, in uh, my house. It was close to the river, and now why I'm in this situation. So uh, I think what we need to do, what media must do, is to link mitigation with adaptation, which is going really to the causes of uh, of climate change. Of course, you cannot do that during a climate disaster because, you know, as we said before, people are not ready for that kind of conversation. So that's why the discussion on climate change must go much beyond climate. Discussion on climate change must include economy, society, political industries. Uh, the way we define our future, we need to look at how we want to live in 20, 50 years, how our children will have to live, which habits, which kind of society will have to live. And the way we define today, these policies will define the way they will live in the future. So the conversation in the media should not only be focused on uh, the immediate uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and the disaster that happened, but should be constant. And the link should be made between economic experts and scientists in order to have a narrative that can combine the two. If you look at the main strategy that we have now at national level to reduce emissions, is the plan, the energy and climate plan. And if you look into that plan, we're not talking about climate only, we're talking about the way we uh, we, we live uh, in, in our buildings with energy efficiency, the way we move, we transport, the way we define our energy strategy, the way we define our industrial strategy for the next 50, 20 years. And we need to look at it in a perspective that shows not only the negative side, who's gonna bear the cost of that transition, but which are the real opportunities on that. And if you see the real opportunities are not only something that uh, you, can, you can see at national level, if you see the, uh, the strategy, for instance, of the, of the United States with the, uh, with the IRA, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, which says, we must focus on the technology of the transition. The European Green Deal of Industrial Plan says the same thing. We should focus on the uh, on that, that kind of, of transition. So that's why we should focus a narrative that goes beyond climate and embrace the real transformation that this society needs. Of course, considering all the costs and the challenges, but also highlighting which are the opportunities that can can come uh, can come there. Uh, and, and I conclude by saying that, of course journalists and media experts should be trained on that. So I think we should work much more on get them prepared on what are the narratives and also to follow the science. And science is not only the climate scientists, but it's also economists, independent economists. Otherwise, if you follow the narratives only of the politics and the private sector, you risk to have a narrative which is strict, which is influenced by you know private interest or interests which are not the interest of the society. And uh, I have a question. Uh, based on your experience as a journalist and communicator, uh, uh, why is some why the, the climate change uh, appears to be the elephant in the room? So there is, but nobody wants to see it. Well, I think uh, people. I think the problem is that. It's difficult to make that kind of connection between what can you do and the impact that you can make when you see that probably your actions are not enough, because then you have big countries that are producing and say, okay, but I'm a little person, you know, I do my, I do my life. How can my life can impact on that? So I think that's the difficult, and the media should be able to show that this can in fact make a difference. So this is very important. And there is also another element that I want to highlight that is sometimes the, the format of TV, newspapers, when you have two ideas, one in front of another, you consider those ideas as equal. But most of the time, they're not. If you have someone which is advocating what the science is saying, this person has behind the entire community of scientists, which you know prove that what he's saying is right. On the other side, you have an opinion. 
but in, on TV, on the papers, for the public, these are seen as two uh, ideas. And these risk to polarize the public in two sides, one against another, when in fact, the majority of the people, they have reasonable doubt about the transition and the narrative of the media should go in that direction, trying to answer which are the reasonable doubts that you may have on the transition and not trying to polarize more of the people. Thank you, thank you, Andrea. And one example could be also talking about best practice. Uh, should be Alessandro Macina. Uh, hello, ciao Alessandro. Hi, colleagues, good morning to you. Good morning, Alessandro Macina is a reporter from Presa Diretta, which is a RAI, uh, really uh, good audience program. Uh, and so you covering a lot of issues among them also climate change and uh, environmental problems uh, and um, but before starting with you I think uh, we can also have a look to the last uh, yes I agree from Alessandro <laughs> Il riciclo sarà l'industria strategica del futuro elettrico. Per ora in Italia c'è solo un impianto che ricicla batterie a litio. È frutto dell'intuizione di un imprenditore veneto già attivo nel settore rifiuti che dieci anni fa ha comprato negli Stati Uniti la tecnologia da impianti esistenti e ha brevettato un sistema per riciclare i preziosi minerali presenti nei nostri oggetti portatili, dai telefonini ai PC ai tablet. Questa è la bike classica, le vengono smontate, ogni singola cella contiene 12 grammi, in questo caso 15 grammi di litro cobalto ossido. Queste sono batterie delle auto? Sì, arrivano già da due anni, tre anni, per esempio Stellantis, il gruppo Fiat Iveco, ci spedisce un carico ogni mese più o meno. Questo è un impianto di cosiddetto pretrattamento, vuol dire che da ogni singola cella delle batterie si ricava polvere catodica, la cosiddetta black mass contenente i minerali, compreso il litio. Tiro fuori circa 15 tonnellate al mese di prodotto finito. Quindi sono 4 tonnellate di cobalto, 5 e circa una tonnellata e mezzo di litio. Una vera e propria miniera di litio di cui oggi, senza una filiera del riciclo e batterie, non sappiamo che farcene in Italia. E così viene rivenduto tutto in Nord America e in Asia. Questo va in Sud Corea. Ho avuto richieste proprio in settimana anche del mercato cinese. E naturalmente lo vendete tutto. Sì, e avrei richieste per almeno tre o quattro volte tanto. Stanno arrivando dei grossi gruppi industriali dall'America, parte dalla Cina, per poter raccogliere i rifiuti europei e italiani per poi trasferirli nel loro paese. Esatto, e quindi lo faremo noi. Eh, sicuramente, devono riportarsi a casa la batteria e quindi non è più bisogno di comprare il litio o cobalto. Non si vogliono la black mass, perché con altri processi di trattamento si ritorna a questo, il litio in purezza, con cui fare nuove... So, this reportage was uh, in Italian, but uh, we saw batteries, and we are talking about recycling the waste, uh, what, what remains of the green energy, basically. So what's your yeah. experience from this point of view? Yeah, sorry for the Italian language of the video, but now I'm talking about this, um, just a brief introduction. Yeah, I realized several TV reports across the world about climate and the ecological transition at the present Diretta, that is a leading prime time news program of Bry, we produce long length reports. And six years ago, we started explaining climate science to a prime time audience. Today, we talk more and more about ecological transition. And as a journalist, my key words now are debunking and fact checking. Why? Because uh, there is, a, as we know, a huge debate around the ecological transition. We may say against the ecological transition and its cost, the jobs we will lose, its environmental impact. And people need to know if it's true or not. So that's why fact checking. Because I think an objective 
fact checking can show with facts and figures that the transition is not our problem, it's our biggest opportunity. Uh, one year ago, I thought about the slow growth of renewables in Italy. Uh, it is not possible to run only with renewables, uh, we used to say. The reality is that in Italy, it takes an average of six years to authorize a new renewable plant, six years when it takes a few months to install it. This means that uh, when you finally have the, all the authorizations, you are installing an older technology, considering the steps forward that are made every year. And if you want to update your project with new technology, you lose another two years uh, with the new permissions. Another thing, another fake news is often said, we cannot change our beautiful landscape, world famous landscape with renewables. Of course, it is so important to govern, to rule the process and control it, but there is no need to fill the Italian landscape. Technologies are more and more efficient. If 10 years ago, three wind turbines were needed, today one is enough to have the same energy. And the same for solar panels, there are trackers that follow the sun automatically to collect as much light as possible, double-sided panels that also collect the albedo, and then Italian factory makes them. And to be independent, do you know how much surface area of the country is needed? 1% of our unused agricultural soils, 1%. So the reality, <laughs> after this fact checking, is that we waste time, we make renewables, lose time, but at the same time, we are buying gas for the next 20, 30 years. Countries very similar to us, Spain and Portugal, are doing the opposite. We showed this to the audience. Of course, it is possible to use less and less fossil, fossil energy. In October, then, we thought about the most discussed aspect of the ecological transition, that is mobility, electric cars. It may seem uh, obvious uh, that we need to change our way to move, but it's not. And uh, electric cars are at the center of the debate on raw materials uh, for the energy transition. We need mining, yes, it is true. And it is right to ask not to move from uh, one dependency to another, from oil to critical metals. But number one, there are so many fake news about raw materials. Let's take just one, cobalt. Cobalt is less and less a problem in electric cars because the chemistry that is winning is another one. It's lithium iron phosphate. For example, the most famous car maker use the, these batteries without cobalt. On the contrary, cobalt continues to be inside our cell phones, in the laptop from which I'm, I'm speaking now. And why? Because cobalt is important for the portable devices. But we don't care this cobalt. We are only interested in the one for electric cars. Second, we need to consider the life cycle. The ecological transition has the possibility to be a circular economy. We'll never have the same uh, with oil. We burn it and we need more and more. Li lithium, on the other end, does not finish in the batteries. It remains inside the battery even when after 10, 15 years, it is no longer needed for the car. And then the battery can have a second life as storage. And that's another eight, 15 years. The Amsterdam Stadium energy storage system is made from old car batteries and the Fiumicino airport is doing the same and will become independent in one year with solar panels and battery storage from car battery, of course. Third, after the second life or after the car use, we have recycling, <laughs> what that is the video was about. I can recover the lithium and make other batteries with that. According to the Polytechnic of Milan, it is a 6 billion euro economy by 2030 for Europe. 
But in Italy, as we have seen in this uh, brief video, there is only one small recycling plant, uh, and every month it ships tons of lithium and other recycled metals back to America and China and Asia. That is, that's because in Italy, we don't believe in the electric car economy. It's a paradox again. We worry about lithium mining, but every month, every month, we send a lithium mine outside Italy. Fourth, we have research. The European battery's goal is to be recycled and to use less critical materials. There is a law and there is a project for this. It's called Battery 2030. Uh, the reality is that everyone is looking for new materials, uh, less criticals, and sodium batteries, uh, sodium ion batteries, sodium, the, the one we have in the salt, without lithium, of course, are always, uh, are almost ready, sorry, to be industrialized. So when we talk about ecological transition, we cannot say that all this possibility doesn't exist and only talk about the costs of the transition and not also calculate the opportunities. In the transition, we have an alternative, we have a solution, we have research, we can have circularity. In today's status quo, unfortunately not. And this is why when we talk about transition, the comparison with oil, that is the elephant in the room, that is our past and our present is not uh, optional. It is mandatory because oil, I can only extract and burn it, extract. And when I burn, I have lost it for millennia. And they need always more of it or more of it in an infinite loop. Oil is in the hands of a few people. I will never be able to produce it to produce it by myself and I'll never have a gasoline a gasoline pump station at home. On the contrary, I can produce renewable energy by myself with the sun and have a wall box in the garage or I can be inside a, a renewable energy community. In the transition, energy is democratic, but it's not only this. It is true that oil brought the world out the cave it built the, the global world we have around us, the global economy we have around us. But it's also true that after 150 years of oil and gas drilling, we need a cleaner, more sustainable and efficient world. Efficient. And we found more efficient, cleaner and sustainable technologies. And they also, and they are also competitive from an economic point of view. A traditional car in the best scenario has an efficiency of 40%, but on average, it's only 20. It means that when I fill up my car, I don't need 60, 80% of the fuel I, I feel because I, because I lose it as heat inside a combustion engine. It also means that uh, I also waste uh, at least 60% of how much I pay for gasoline, the electric car on the contrary has an efficiency of 80%. So let's ask ourselves, not only who has an interest in making the transition, but as a, a journalist, I am also interested to know who has an interest in not making it, in blocking it or slowing it. And to conclude, I think the answer is uh, right uh, around you in Dubai. Uh, a final uh, figure that may help in Italy around 90 hey, percent. Uh, yeah. No, I don't want to throw, but I want to ask you uh, if uh, do you think that Italy has a future for recycling? Yes, yes, of course uh, it can have. We we uh, we must we must we must have because we don't have uh, lithium mines. Uh, we need to find lithium, we have to extract it. So it's a very long process and also a difficult process, also an environmental difficult process. So the, one of our best opportunities is, of course, to recycle, recycle. But uh, not only, uh, as, um, as I was saying, 
uh, recycling is, is important, but uh, on the other end, uh, Europe is working very hard uh, to find new materials. We, we know, all the world knows that uh, uh, we cannot uh, substitute the dependency of oil with the dependency of lithium. So uh, in all the uh, research centers uh, in Europe and not only in Europe, they are searching for new materials that are more available, less critical, and uh, we are close to find a good alternative. For example, the sodium ion battery that is uh, already uh, used with success uh, in storage can also have a future, a future research say in uh, in cars. In cars, so in a, in a few days, uh, actually, I'm traveling uh, to the north of Europe, where this uh, research is uh, is uh, very is very forward, and uh, and also to to show uh, what can we do with recycle. I think the people people need uh, need to to know uh, and to see that we have an alternative that uh, the ecological transition can be a circular economy. And this for me is the most, uh, the most important difference with the, with the status quo, with the actual model, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Alessandro. So let's uh, go ahead with uh, talking about communication because uh, we are with Alessandra Stolfi, Global Exhibition Director, Green and Technology Division of the Italian Exhibition Group. So you are really worldwide uh, and you go in uh, any place, you went in any place. What's about, uh, what, what is the most important uh, way to communicate uh, about uh, the effects on ecological transition, but based on, on your experience as yes. director of this NTB, which is an organizer of events. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you to the organizer for giving me this opportunity to explain uh, like uh, a private group, like Italian Exhibition Group that can uh, um, giving the, the, the crucial debate uh, on uh, information and communication in the climate change uh, uh, problem. Um, first of all, just a few way, few words about the uh, exhibition group is a uh, reminder of the exhibition and uh, events uh, in Italy and worldwide, as you told before, uh, in different sectors, uh, food, beverage, jewelry, um, hospitality, tourism, and green technology. And green, te green technology is my, my field uh, with uh, Ecomondo and the energy. Uh, especially Ecomondo is, uh, is uh, the main international events uh, in um, both uh, uh, at the European level uh, and in the Mediterranean area. In the green and circular economy, uh, as before mentioned, uh, um, Alessandro, uh, which bring together um, all the best, the best technology, services, and industrial solutions for the ecological transition. Um, what we, we did in these uh, 26 uh, years, uh, um, we understand uh, the role that uh, is so big fair can play uh, in disseminating uh, the environmental protection uh, and the culture and the innovative culture on environmental friendly production model. Because before Andrea explained uh, how it's important to combine uh, not only climate change uh, discussion, but economical uh, change discussion, because we have to change a uh, culture and a mentality. What we do uh, with uh, through Ecomondo, we put together in the same place uh, a big community, a, a very huge community uh, composed by scientists, economic eco eco economists, uh, um, students, uh, association, industries, uh, all types. The real world. Of, yes, the real world all together uh, to. Um, designed the guideline of the fair. So in our fair, 
we can express uh, what is useful for the society. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, the, the strongness of the Ecomundo uh, is uh, um, to highlight uh, that uh, we have the best technologies are available for changing uh, the situation. And sometimes, as Andrea told before, uh, the problem is uh, uh, some private interest, some lobbies that uh, um, put some uh, uh, obstacle to this transition. But the transition is uh, right on the track. So I think that uh, Ecomondo is really a place where we can uh, uh, touch with your end uh, that more than 2,000 companies, Europe, and also Italy and Europe companies uh, have the best solution. And we are uh, a virtual uh, countries in terms of uh, circular economy uh, because we are full of raw material. And so we are able to recycle um, all kinds of materials, all kinds of waste uh, um, compared to other eco economies. For example, from Germany, we are at the best uh, position compared to German, to France, to, to Spain, to Poland, and uh, uh, sometimes it's not so easy to communicate our value. So it's very important to communicate how our country is able to do that. This is the first uh, example. Then I want to, to, uh, to go to another example uh, that we we, we, we did in the last edition, uh, because Ecomundo um, organized uh, 230 uh, conferences. Um, but also um, every year, the State General of the Green Economy, promoted by the Ministry uh, of the, the Ministry of Environmental and Energy, and Energy Security, uh, and in this uh, last uh, report we presented uh, uh, in, in Ecomondo in November, uh, we look at the uh, ecological transition from a different perspective. That is, that economic benefit of the ecological transition are higher than cost associated uh, of the transition itself. Um, so we demonstrate that. Uh, um, we mentioned in, in the report that decarbonization of the Italian economy entices an annual cost of 14.7 billion euros in the 2020-2030 period, but generates direct saving of 6.6 .6 billion euros per year and stimulates an industry that brings additional revenues and new job a new um a, a new um green green jobs for for young people so meaning that uh, ecology makes profits yes yes so it is very important to explain uh, a different perspective because uh, the, the, the 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 storytelling sometimes is that uh, with the transit with the ecological transition we lose uh, uh, jobs, uh, we lose uh, uh, privilege, we, we will become poor, and uh, it is not real, uh, the, 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 the real storytelling. So I think it's very important uh, to uh, um, have a report, scientists, and, and, and good communication for um, explain what really we can do. And the second example is uh, uh, the young generation, because, for example, in uh, uh, in Ecomondo, um, we also um, dedicated a special attention to the young millennials, uh, focusing on the new green job and uh, link to ecological transition. Because sometimes there is a big a gap between schools and training, and uh, the 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 companies and the the, the, the the world, the real world. So we dedicated a, a long program um, addressed to youth um, and in, involving over 3,000 students uh, during the four days uh, in, in Rimini. And I think getting the youth involved is essential, essential 
a since the present situation is made of extreme activism on one end and moral disengagement of the other end. So there is really, a, yes, again. Um, I give you just a, a number, 87% of, uh, of the young people claim for more information, but they don't know which sources they should rely on given the complexity of environmental issue, because it is very difficult to explain why nuclear is good or is, is better um, energy efficiency or is better recycling or is better to combine different uh, uh, items. So it is really difficult. Yes. Yes. So, so young are sometimes at the risk is that people may not fully understand the actual contribution they can give to improve the serious situation. So what I can do in my own uh, and little life like, like you explained before. So this is very important because we have to be all engaged, the young, the citizen, the businessman, the government, the agency, every together, like uh, we demonstrate with the, the COVID-19, uh, we combat the COVID only together, not a singular stage. This is, for me, very, very clear. And this is the role that Ecomondo and my group try to contribute to, to this uh, result, to, the, to this goal. United, yes. better than Andrea Bianda, Echo Think Tank. Uh, do you think there is a, a gap by communication talking about youth, uh, young people? Yes, I may. I wanted to add something to what uh, Alessandro said before about the banking and, uh, and fact checking, uh, which I think it is, we should make a reality check. And I wanted to give you an example of what's happening in the narrative around COP. Uh, Saturday, uh, 22 countries signed uh, a commitment to tri to triple uh, nuclear energy by 2050, and he made the headline in Italy. Everybody was talking about that. Uh, although uh, nuclear power in Italy is not in our energy and climate plan. You know, the, 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 the plan which will be sent to the European Commission uh, uh, in June 2024, it doesn't include energy, uh, nuclear energy in the mix of uh, Italy for 2050. On top of that, Italy at G7 level took the commitment to uh, produce electricity only by renewables by 2035. So the reality check means that why should I talk about that if it's not part of my strategy? At the same time, a few days uh, uh, later, uh, there was a commitment of 28 countries on energy efficiency. There was not a single headline on that. And Italian economy is based on energy efficiency. We have tons of little uh, M M PMEs in the northern Italy working on the technology of energy transition. So this will much more benefit discussion on that. Instead, we talk about something which is, you know, doesn't exist at the moment in our strategy. So I think that's something like an example that shows the uh, narrative uh, of that. Going to your question, um, which also today is the day of the youth, so it makes much more sense to discuss that. We need to think about that the youth today, some, someone that was born after 2000, is born in a crisis. So they have a perception which is very different than the perception that my white beard, <laughs> uh, the, 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 the people with, with white beard like me have, which have born in, in the other century. So I think they have a... a uh, a, a perspective which is very different. We need to look at the fact that, unfortunately, if you look at the Italian example, for instance, there were, these people do not vote yet, or the majority of people that go to the polls. But they will vote. They will vote. But the people that have the economic opportunity to make the change, as they are not there yet. If I have to renew my house, 
unfortunately, it's not a millennial that is going to renew exams. It's someone that does not have this kind of perception of the crisis that they have. So I think they're very important to highlight to the orders that if we not do something now, uh, the climate crisis becomes a climate catastrophe. And that's going to be too late for doing something efficient. And from then, talking about the Komodo, how long have you been uh, organizing the events? Uh, 26 years ago, we have the idea that uh, waste uh, is not a problem, but is a resource. Uh, you can imagine that 26 years ago was a concept, a very, very innovative concept, because you know, there was a lot of emergency, uh, the waste in Naples, the waste in Milan, the waste in Rome, and Italy um, really uh, didn't do nothing for, for uh, waste. And so um, from the beginning, we, we have the awareness that we can do something for young generation, young generation, but also for the industries because uh, Ecomundo is really a, um, I think, um, the best example in the world and not all in Europe, uh, where uh, innovation have a, a, a place to explain what really the, the, the strongness of innovation in terms of the green economy. So the green economy is very large because you have. Uh, soil generation, waste, water, and, and, and energy efficiency services, uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, applied to waste. So you, you have a very, very big uh, range of uh, sectors. Uh, but the, the concept is uh, um, waste as resources and not waste as an emergency. And the other um, pillars was uh, uh, information training and good info uh, and good uh, communication. In the last edition, we, we host uh, a forum on the responsible, um, responsible communication in cooperation with uh, the Ministry of uh, uh, Energy Security or Environmental Energy Security and with FERPI and um, uh, the Global Alliance of Journalists want to uh, ask for the 18 goals. We have 16 goals in the uh, 2030 agenda, and they want to ask for 18th goal regarding the, the uh, responsibility, the commun uh, responsibility communication. Because this is really a, an important topic also in the realization of the transition, the right transition, a just transition. So I think that all together, I repeat, because Ecomondo is a platform, is a place where different, uh, um, different uh, uh, private public uh, companies and uh, stakeholders uh, have to uh, cooperate together for a, a good uh, common, and the transition is uh, really difficult to, to reach, but we are I repeat, I am optimism. I, I think that, that we are on the right street, the right way, and we can back. Uh, it's impossible to come back, to come back from, yes. I can imagine our transition. Yes. Alessandro Macina is, is still there. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Here I am. I'm <laughs> live. So talking about communication and journalists, and basically every day, you talk with this kind of issue, the public insight news. Is there something uh, a journalist can do in order to, to communicate in a better way? Yes, yes, of course, the, the role of the media is so important in clarifying, you know, in, uh, in clear the, the debate, the, the discussion, the, the storytelling. Uh, we are responsible also for the storytelling no? we are doing about climate change, about ecological transition. Yes. So I think for me is very important always to do uh, um, to, to do the speech of the, the of science. So let's give voice uh, to the scientists. They are the experts. 
and let's try also to to translate to big audience their message when it's not uh, even so so clear but scientists it's 30 years they are doing uh, a, a really a big effort to explain us no the, the situation the problem uh, all the effects we are moving to the effects of climate change so uh, voice to the scientists uh, also a study a study of course a study a lot as a journalist uh, because as uh, also andrea uh, said very well uh, this is not only a, it's an environmental uh, an environmental issue is a, a whole society economy health also health health issue uh, and i think the the role of the journalist is also to uh, to to collect all, all of these things uh, together and so not as andrea very well said not only talk about climate, also find new perspectives for for talking about it, and always do a construct a, a good a constructive speech with without mentioning opportunities, a solution, and the fact that uh, maybe a, a better, more sustainable world. Uh, of course, it's possible. It's not. It's not a dream. It's our reality, it's, and it must be our future. <laughs> so, Alessandro, last question. We're running out of time. Avoiding uh, negationism, avoiding denial. Uh, what to do in a few <clears throat> words? It's if you to go words, but... <laughs> well, I don't have an answer for probably to that. What I can say to strengthen uh, the role of youth uh, on this day, we should discuss about youth, is that the right, we need to ask the right, the right questions. For me today, the right question is, do the youth, uh, do we provide the youth with the right skills for the uh, green economy and the food of the future jobs? Do we think that now we are giving that or we are giving them false solutions and skills that will not be needed in the future markets? And so that's, I think, the main question that we need to ask for the future of youth today. This is a big question and uh, I think we are going to, to leave with, with this question to be answered uh, in, in, in the future. So thank you to Alessandro Marcina, remotely reporter from RAI. Andrea Ghianda from Eco Tic Tank and uh, Alessandra Stolfi from Eco Mondo. So thank you and uh, bye.